Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. What's going on guys, this is Rob and we are back with Invincible. Yes, we are. Okay, cool. So here's the thing, right? Like if you guys remember the last video that we did, you ended up having Mark who basically brought his stepbrother back home and I'll have the playlist for Invincible down in the description, but uh, but Mark brought his stepbrother back home, right? So basically the, the son of Omni-Man on a different planet, right? And, and what this does is it kind of picks up with this idea of like Mark's mom raising him, right? Now, initially when Mark brought him back, it was really kind of a shock for Mark's mom, right? Just because of the fact that one, like everything had seemingly happened so fast and she never really had a chance to cope. We talked about that in the last video. That was the biggest issue that Mark's mom had is I guess she coped, but her method of coping was alcohol, right? She just kind of delved into alcoholism. Now, that's one of the things that I loved about Invincible. For us as regular people, we all have our own coping mechanisms, right? Some of us work out, some of us make comic book YouTube videos. Others end up kind of jumping into less productive things. And alcohol is a very easy thing to fall into. The trap of alcoholism is all too easy, right? I've got members of my family who have fallen prey to that because it's very easy to kind of numb the pain, right? To just sort of succumb to that drunken stupor and then you just don't feel anything, right? You don't feel any real sadness. You don't really feel any real remorse. You just kind of don't really feel a whole lot. And the result is that it makes the pain go away. And that really, I think, is a testament more to what Deborah was going through than anything else because seemingly her entire world came crashing down like that, right? In the blink of an eye, your husband turns out to be a villain from a different planet who openly admits that he never really cared about you at all, right? Your son is this walking, talking reminder of the man that you that you loved, you know, that you essentially lost, right? I mean, that, that's that's kind of the crazy thing. And so for Mark's mom, having a little kid to take care of here is a great thing for her because it kind of gives her a chance to sort of start fresh, right? To kind of start over to a degree. And it sort of gives her something to live for beyond herself, right? A chance to, to look at something and to say like, I can work for this thing, right? I can build on this thing. You know, I can raise this child into somebody productive and admittedly hold on to a portion of her husband, the part of her husband that she loved so much. And so from there, you switch over to a villain named Mastermind. Not a whole lot doing here. This guy's kind of a dick and he does exactly what a man with a name mastermind would do he controls the minds of other people <laughs> and so ultimately mark and, and and the guardians basically get the upper hand on him and that's that's more or less it but then you basically end up jumping to mark meeting with amber but the whole conversation with amber is kind of this funny moment right because mark has a tendency to kind of get caught up in the moment right not really caught up in himself mark's pretty far from being a, a person who's full of, of arrogance and hubris but it, but it's one of these things where he's kind of like okay so she's like he's like you know what's you know you look pretty tired she's like yeah i was i was up really late and you know i've got like a big test in an hour he's like okay well do you want to ditch class and go with me to africa and she's like what did i just say i got a test in an hour mark <laughs> mark doesn't listen but then she's kind of like africa it's Africa, you know, like how often do people get to go to Africa? Now, here's one of the things that I wanna draw your attention to, because we actually kind of skipped over this in the previous videos that we've done, but here's one of the things that I wanna draw your attention to. If you guys remember, probably from the TV show, assuming that you never read the comics, which I don't know why you wouldn't be reading the comics, but uh, in the in the TV show, you had that mission to Mars, right? You had those weird little aliens that had the capability of like taking over and conquering whole worlds by possessing people, things like that, right? So one of the astronauts, a guy by the name of Russ Livingston, is basically a guy who was left behind, right? That guy you saw with like the really dark eyes and he's like nah. he looks like he would have like the the kind of laugh a man would have if he had like a handlebar mustache and he was a villain like <laughs> you know like that kind of a thing well one of the martians actually made it back to earth right and so the result of this is that you do kind of get a little bit of, of of discussion there but this guy kind of realizes like given the powers that he has the ability to shapeshift because he's more or less invincible's version of martian manhunter that he can in turn become a superhero and so that kind of gives you this answer of what happened with this this alien that ended up taking on the form of of Russ Livingston and then showing up on earth now there are caveats here right the way the the explanation is given to us he can't necessarily hold the position for an exceedingly long long amount of time and even then like with him being on earth he still is concerned about his race back on mars now when i say that he's concerned about his people it's more of like more like just the rebels right because like in the end he's just kind of like i mean i hated our monarch right our monarch was like super corrupt i'm kind of glad that i got away from them <laughs> You know, I, I I hate this. Uh, it is kind of interesting in terms of how he sees his own people. So I imagine he probably only really longs for the rebels. And he kind of goes as far as to say that, right? Like himself and the other rebels hated the enslavement of the squids and, and so on and so forth. But when you basically transition to Africa, it's kind of this funny moment, right? Because Mark was basically invited here by Eve. That Mark's mom had given him, you know, Eve's number when she was out in, in Africa. And then he had called her and she was like, yeah, you know, come hang out. So Mark brings Amber. All right, here's the thing, gentlemen. Gentlemen, fellas, guys out there who are not very good at picking up on clues, right? One of the most frustrating things with the nature of the game when it comes
happens to the lady folk, to the to the women folk, is that they never really tell you when they're digging you, right? Sometimes they do, but it's usually dropping subtle hints. And I guess part of the game is if you can pick up on it and kind of build up that tension, right? Other times it's a pain in the ass, you know? It's just like, all right, whatever, man. I got more important things to do. But this is one of those times, man, when a girl that you know digs you is in another part of the world and says, hey, come hang out. You do one of two things, right? Either you're with, like, you're Mark and you're with a girl and you say, look, I'd love to, but like, you know... I'm with a girl right now, so let's you know, let's table this right now. Or if you're single, you're like, let's go, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's all that is and she's dropping all the hints man like she's just literally telling him that she digs him and it's kind of funny because mark just seems oblivious to it right like like that guy like mark is that guy and so it's just like okay mark come on man and this is one of the cool things about adam eve's character too though robert kirkman and he almost he does it so subtly adam eve i would argue is probably the most powerful of all the characters that exist out there because she can alter matter on an atomic level now if this was a marvel comic mark would be like man like how advanced can this be and she's like i can conquer the universe and then she would just ascend and become a cosmic entity and then she would just hover in the stars forevermore and then appear every once in a while because she's a plot device now like that's what marvel comics would do i love what kirkman does right this is a girl that can control matter on the molecular level and it's just kind of like yeah man like it's a thing that she can do right she can just kind of will things into existence but it's also a little bit of, of a learning curve here because not even adam eve is fully aware of everything that she can do and she even says that right like she's learning to use her powers in a more more complex way it's one of the reasons why she came out here one to kind of get away from everything but two to explore her full capabilities when adam eve reaches like her full potential which she will she is a demon it's insane how powerful she is right like she just gets to this ridiculously op level but mark also does like a little bit of catching up with her right because like he basically tells her like i've got a little brother and it's like what <laughs> you talk to your dad what like your dad's married to like a bug what <laughs> like <laughs> what is going on here and so he does like the the, the whole kind of spilling the beans right and more or less everything that we've kind of caught up with here and everything that we've we've sort of discussed here and then while the two of them are talking they realize amber's over there now this is a funny depiction of her character because one of the things that kirkman kind of hits on here when it comes to the the various parts of invincible is he almost kind of portrays people who are superheroes as kind of a higher cast or a higher order not in so far as how they conduct themselves right i mean you don't have mark you know flying around i look down on you that's not really what he the, the kind of philosophy he has but uh but that's not really how he operates it's really more of the depiction of amber like one of the things that uh that, that adam eve really picks up on here is like amber never looks up right she almost never ever looks up to the sky she's always just kind of looking forward or just kind of looking around right just you know just kind of minding your own business but it's one of these things where amber's kind of depicted here as a person that in the grand scheme of things isn't really striving for much in this life right she's just kind of striving for just good enough and and, and i say just good enough in relation to people like mark or people like adam eve i mean granted they have abilities that amber simply just doesn't have but with having enhanced capabilities not just powers but with enhanced capabilities enhanced access to things comes enhanced abilities to achieve more in this world right it's really kind of establishing this idea that amber's just not for mark right i mean they're just it's just not really supposed to be that way but it also kind of reflects itself in the conversation that like adam even mark had had and the sense that that mark was kind of talking to her about how her and amber have kind of gotten into a, a few fights here and there and that's par for the course when you're in a relationship you do get into arguments you do get into fights you do get into disagreements right because what's a relationship if you're not taking two people who don't know anything about each other, slapping them together and saying, now make it work, basically what it is. So of course you're going to have some disagreements and so on and so forth. But the various issues that Amber and Mark have been dealing with, a lot of it came from Mark's deception, right? In the sense that Mark didn't really tell her he was a superhero initially. He would just disappear for huge amounts of time and then return home. And she'll just be there with open arms. That in effect, she would kind of put her life on hold to a degree. And so far as like what it means to have a significant other because of a superhero escapades, we don't know if that's something that she can cope with. Adam Eve is far more of a compatible person for Mark than Amber is, at least on that level. But Mark kind of counters that. And he says, yeah, but like we have a lot in common. There's a lot of things that we like. But one of the things to know about relationships, that 1% makes all the difference. You can find somebody who's 99.9% .9 compatible with you. But depending on what that 0.1% makes up, it could be a deal breaker, right? Like it's like that, like that 0.1% could be, I don't want to have kids. And that right there totally tortures the relationship, right? Your, your deal breakers. And so it's kind of an interesting thing there because you end up having uh, Mark who really kind of gets a phone call here uh, while he and Adam Eve and, and Amber are hanging out. And it's just kind of like Mark help, right? She's in trouble, Mark. How fast can you get home? Like it's his mom. And then somebody, somebody basically answers alongside his mom and Mark 
bolts. He's just like, Eve, can you get Amber home? And she's like, yeah. And he's like, okay, cool, gotta go. Bam! And then just bolts, right? Just like immediately takes off. When he gets back home, he's met with Angstrom Levy. Now, Angstrom Levy is a character that we haven't really talked about yet, right? And he was kind of covered a little bit in the previous stories that we did. In all honesty, I didn't cover him at the time because I didn't want to mess up the pacing of the story to kind of have this, this cohesive discussion about what happened to Omni-Man after he left Earth and then suddenly sidetrack to Angstrom Levy. But the idea behind this is that at a previous point in time, Angstrom Levy had actually come into contact with an alternate reality version of himself. And the reason why is because Angstrom can make portals to different dimensions. And so what he wanted to do, or at least kind of look to, to bolster his abilities and so on and so forth, that he ended up having himself hooked to a kind of machine of sorts by the Mahler twins. The problem with this is that when Invincible showed up, that Angstrom Levy started summoning all these Mahler twins from other dimensions, and then Mark was actually on the verge of being killed, right? Being beat to death. And so Angstrom took the harness off his head and it created a kind of feedback where it basically turned him into the version of himself that you see now. But Angstrom is a wildly powerful character. It's one of these things where his powers are kind of unique in that way, right? I mean, it's not as always powerful because he can just look at Mark and disintegrate him or like beat him to death because of his astronomical strength. It's just one of these things where he can just kind of open portals. And that's what he tells Mark, right? You know, ultimately he, the whole reason why he comes after Mark for this is because one, the whole experiment or the, the whole, you know, kind of situation that led him to becoming who he was, it ultimately kind of erased portions of the entire incident. So he doesn't really remember things as they happened. Instead, all he really remembers are kind of, it's kind of like the big picture of the big picture, the big chunks, but missing the nuance. And so it's, you know, I was a regular guy and then Invincible showed up and then Invincible faced off against the Mahler twins that I brought from other dimensions. And then like something happened and then now I'm like this, right? So Invincible caused this. When Mark goes to attack him, he opens a portal and then sends Mark to a different dimension where dinosaurs have more or less become sentient, where they can actually talk. And he escapes by the skin of his teeth and then comes back through the portal again and then goes to attack him uh, yet again. And then like another portal's opened up and he ends up in the Marvel Universe. And then he actually encounters Dr. Octopus and like crashes him into a building. And he's like, oh dude, man, I'm so sorry about that. And then bail, right? Like for one page, he meets, he meets Dr. Octopus, right? So then he comes back to the portal again, only this time, the webbing of Spider-Man follows him, right? So hence the title, Invincible meets Spider-Man for like two seconds. Like it's, it's kind of nuts, but it's small little stuff like this. One thing that I do want to point out here, this concept of like alternate dimensions, that's something that I want you guys to keep in the back of your head, but it's kind of this cat and mouse game, right? Mark is fighting out of emotion. He's not fighting out of logic. And remember, that's one of the lessons that his dad was trying to teach him. You cannot fight emotionally. You have to fight logically. Whenever you fight emotionally, you're going to make just ridiculous decisions. And it's one of the things that Angstrom Levy's counting on, right? I remember Mark is young, right? He's a college age kid, but at the same time, he doesn't really have the experience to know what kind of rational decisions he should be making. And so it's, it's one of these things where he goes to attack yet again, because Angstrom knows like the more that the, the, the angrier that Mark gets, the more reckless he gets and the more reckless he gets, the less he thinks. And so it's one of these things where he's just kind of playing games with him. And so he sends him into a dimension where there was a zombie breakout, right? And like everybody in that world was essentially infected by zombies. And it happens like that over and over and over again. Every time he goes to attack, he's sent to a different dimension. Now he's, he's, he's beaten. He's not necessarily broken. He's kind of tattered. He comes across Batman. Like literally he's like, he's like, I mean, you dress like a bat and your name's what? Like, isn't that kind of lazy? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it lazy to dress as a bat and call yourself Batman? Like, kind of a lazy name. And so it's one of these, these sort of weird things where, like, he finally just kind of sits and waits. And then eventually a portal opens up and Angstrom sticks his head through. And then he immediately goes through the portal, right? And then goes to attack Angstrom Levy again. And then, yet again, Angstrom Levy opens a portal. And the two of them actually end up fighting through these kind of, like, dimensional waves, right? Like, like literally fighting throughout the multiverse. That's basically what's happening here. They're jumping from universe to universe. And, and the fight's just the two of them until it gets to a point where Mark basically gets the upper hand and gets so mad that Angstrom had threatened his family that he actually beats him to death. This is really the first big moment where the actions of Mark just cost a person their life in extreme rage, right? Where he remembers him, so he, he kind of thinks about his dad, right? Like he, he like literally reminds himself of his dad. And so in that moment, there's a huge kind of crushing sensation here because it's like, oh my God, I'm like my dad. I've basically become my dad. Like this is, this is the person that I've turned into. And so what you end up having is a portal that opens up and essentially the guardians of the globe end up popping out, but it's a future version of their characters, including Adam Eve. Now the conversation here is not overly lengthy. Instead, what had happened is that in the, the main universe, right, the main dimension of Invincible, that Mark had just vanished, right? So as far as he's concerned, it's it's been virtually no time at all, right? Within, within like a few hours, right? All this stuff's gone on for him. For these guardians of the globe, they've been hunting for Mark for 15 years. They've been trying to find him for 15 
15 years and they were finally able to locate him right like they were finally able to pick him up now it's one of these things where adam eve goes running to mark and says okay here's what you have to do go talk to the younger version of me and tell her anything right tell her you love her tell her you don't love her tell her you just want to be good friends whatever but if you never ever tell her how you potentially feel about her she's going to forever hold on to this this possibility that the two of you will end up being together she'll never have anybody else she'll never really be able to live a meaningful life because she will always hope that the two of you are going to get together so tell her whatever it is you need to tell her like tell her whether you, whether you love her or not it doesn't matter but tell her something and so that's kind of the crazy thing is because this sort of sets the stage on what we saw in this issue that amber is not the best fit for mark that adam eve is and it's going to seemingly at least it kind of appears to go in that direction of mark possibly saying something to adam eve whether he does or not is something that i'm not going to reveal to you at least not now anyway following that you end up having essentially a person associated with cecil who actually shows up to the house of deborah to kind of get things organized and so far as like the the little boy the little kid that kind of was brought here by mark and so when the question is asked like have you decided on a name the response is oliver right like i'm going to name this kid oliver it's my father's name like mark's mom is effectively adopting the the stepbrother of mark and the son of omni man right he's officially going to be kind of brought into the family there and so following this what you do is you actually pick up with mark going and visiting the tailor right you guys like you guys know him arthur rosenbaum but it's one of these things where the two of them are kind of talking and, and having a conversation and mark's actually coming to terms with this this idea of the fact that he had basically beat a man to death right and he's coming to terms with a look on on adam eve's face from the future when she said she loved him right just desperation and sorrow as he describes it he's kind of like i mean adam eve is my friend you know and and i like her you know i'm attracted to her but like at the end of the day if i did that it wouldn't really be fair to amber and he says he loves amber but here's the important thing to understand the heart wants what the heart wants and no apologies need to be made for it right that's just the way that it is i mean in the in the game of love somebody's bound to get their heart broken right it's just it's the nature of things if everybody returned the affections of everybody who made advances towards them then monogamy just couldn't exist right so in order to fall in love hearts have to be broken it's just the way that goes it sucks and it's not fair but honestly the world's not necessarily a fair place and so the so ultimately it's kind of like what are you going to do and so he's just kind of like i'm going to stay with amber at the moment right like amber's the one that i'm going to stay with because she's just been so supportive of me right i mean like all these superhero antics disappearing for days or even months or weeks at a time you know like all the stuff that comes with this package of what it means to be with somebody like me she's been through it right she's been you know i wouldn't say thick and thin they haven't been been together long enough to really know but he's just kind of like you know she's been there for me and i feel like it'd be wrong to betray that to destroy that and then to go with somebody else because a future version of herself said hey like i really love you right you know just because a person says they love you doesn't mean you have to love them back and so ultimately the tailor kind of goes to a back room and then comes back and presents mark with these books now these books are ridiculously important and the reason why is because when they're presented to mark mark's just kind of like i mean what like what is this and and you know the tailor's like well I mean, your father was a would like try to be a science fiction writer when he first got here and he wrote a little bit and he made a little bit of money but after that they were all just basically huge failures right so he just started writing like travel books and different things like that and so ultimately these are all handed over to mark and mark starts looking at him and says like i mean like look at the names these, these names are terrible right hate tribes on the planet wreck right this one the man with the invincible gun and so he kind of starts coming through it and reading it and as mark begins to read it he begins to realize his father's books right when in the last video when his dad said find my books and read my books it wasn't because he just wanted his son to know that he tried to write science fiction at some point he's actually going through and mark realizes he's writing himself that literally he's just writing his own stories about tracking down individuals and hunting people who were basically enemies of the Viltrumite empire but each one of these books deals with like an artifact or a weapon or a person with extraordinary skills and that's when mark starts to realize all these things they're basically instructions on how to destroy the Viltrumites. it's literally a blueprint on how to win with that being said guys we're gonna bring this video to an end thank you guys for watching and i will catch you all later peace